Welcome to our webinar, Overcoming Bias to Become Innovative as part of the Dive In Festival. This webinar is a partnership between Kennedy's AIG and Marsh. Now we have a full hour together, starting off with a keynote speech by the acclaimed uh, psychologist, Christina lutzko Otzen. Christina is a leading authority in the academic field of bias awareness and inclusion. Christina holds a PhD in cross-cultural diversity, as well as being the co-author of the book, Bias Conscious Leadership, How Diversity Leads to Better Decision-Making. Following our keynote, I am very lucky to be moderating three very accomplished and in my opinion, brilliant people in a panel discussion. So with us, we have Elisabeth Helmo, also branch manager for AIG in Norway, Leah Lundstel, Pay Equity Leader for Europe, UK, and HR Transformation for Mercer, and Nora Sultan, Legal Associate for Kennedy's in Denmark. Welcome, you guys. An ambition set by the Dive In Festival is that by the end of this event, you as attendees should be able to understand how biased conscious leadership can lead to better decision making, as well as learn from the lived experiences from a group of people with different backgrounds working within the industry, as well as being able to explain the need and benefit of building supportive and psychologically safe working cultures. Now, before Christina starts off her keynote speech, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Fahad Said. I'll be your moderator. Um, I work as an advisor and a facilitator in the ever-evolving field of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Now, in short, that's an acronym for DEIA. You might know it as DNI as well. I worked in communications and PR for several years before making the shift into working full-time as an independent advisor. Now, I personally describe DNI, diversity and inclusion, as a conversation, and it is one that I take very, very seriously. Balancing between research-based approach and academia, but always centered around lived experiences. This is why my work is deeply rooted and connected to community and activism, as well as I was one of the co-founders of an organization called Sabah. That's an organization for ethnic minority LGBT plus persons in Denmark. This was 17 years ago. And as an immigrant in Denmark, having grown up with Pakistani parents and as a Muslim, Sabah was the space where me and so many others found a way to navigate between what society would tell us were conflicting parts of our identity. Now connected to today's theme about innovation, the benefits of building a culture that encourages employees to bring their authentic selves to work um, are supported by data. And I can't emphasize uh, the importance of how much uh, more innovative we can be at the workplace when we are allowed to be ourselves. Finally, before Christina starts off, I've promised that I would fully explain some terms that we will be using loosely within uh, our webinar. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, as short, uh, we, some of us know it as the acronym DEIA. If, um, so diversity if, uh, could be explained as connected to representation and visibility. So inclusion is connected to the sense of belonging, while perspectives for equity is factoring in what obstacles were in place before we could enter the workplace. Now, access is an important factor that I tend to forget myself as a practitioner. I remember once doing a workshop for a client, I received a request for, doing, uh, for the workshop to be done in Danish. That wasn't possible uh, for so many different reasons, and I can't tell you how much of a bad taste that left in my mouth, ha mouth having to exclude persons and people in the workshop with the aim of inclusion. This is why I would always say looking at the full acronym as a process is the way to go about it. All right, Christina, this is where you can take over. So please go ahead with your keynote. Thank you. Thank you for having and thank you for sharing. Um, I'm thrilled want to be here and to be part of the team from Scandinavia. Um, also, 
I want to say that we kind of are part of the wor a world that really emphasizes equality and equity. Uh, we're really into that, but also, funnily enough, we are quite a homogenous, uh, homogeneous part of the world. So we don't always in the workplace, we don't always get presented with all the potential and the obstacles that are in diversity. Even so, I've studied this field for, for many years, and uh, for that reason, I'm here today to talk a little bit about my research. So I want to share some slides now, and I hope you can all see them. Um, so when we talk about in unlocking innovation by the power of inclusion, where well, we want to put diversity into play. And to do that, we need to know a little bit about bias conscious leadership. So that is what I want to tell about uh, talk about today. I want to start with a fundamental bias. I'm not going to share a whole lot of bias with you because there's so many bias, but this one is very fundamental and we can all relate to it. The bias of herd mentality. It's because we human beings, we are quite social and we love to share. And when we imitate each other, we learn from each other. And that's actually a good thing. But sometimes we get so into just imitating each other that it gets to be conform. We just blindly follow each other. And that's not good. And that's why we need to look into studies of conformity. How likely are we to give in to the crowd? That's actually what this uh, figure here on the right set, hand side is about. It's a study, one of the most famous studies within this field. Uh, what the researchers did here was to invite eight people into a room and then they showed them these three lines, A, B and C. And then they asked which one of these lines is the same length as the line to the left. The thing was, it was only person number seven who was a real participant. The rest of the participants were actors uh, who were invited into the study. And now the researcher asked person one, what is your answer? Person number one says, my answer is A. <laughs> then number two gets asked and number two says, well, it's clear to see that A is the same length as the line to the left. Now our person number seven looks at the research leader. Why isn't he saying something? It's clearly wrong. Three and four, they also say A. Now our person number seven thinks, okay, there's something wrong here. Maybe I didn't hear the whole assignment. Maybe I didn't understand it correctly. Five and six, they also say A. And now you can feel the predicament that our person number seven is in. And actually, it turns out that 75% of the participants, they gave in, they followed the crowd. And this is just not in this study. It's been replicated many times. And I don't want you to think out there that, OK, I know those people. They just fold. They just follow. It's so irritating. No, no. This is all of us. It has to do with the fact of uh, if we feel safe in the group we're in or if we are a newcomer and we don't really know the group. So psychological safety is a factor here. When sometimes we feel that we are safe in a group and we can say something opposite of everything, everyone else. And other times we want to wait out and feel more safe. We don't feel we have the power to talk against the crowd. So this doesn't just happen in research rooms. It happens every day in our meeting rooms. We call it groupthink. There are four factors that are really evident here. We focus more on what everyone knows already, so new ideas, they don't really get the time of day. We fail to correct the errors and even amplify them. We follow the statements of those who speak and act first, especially if they have high status in the room. And we become more polarized and we take up even more extreme positions than those we held before we entered this meeting room. This happens in all group, but it happens even more in hom homogeneous groups. And for that reason, we have a rule of thumb. The rule of thumb is that a maximum of 70% uh, should be of the same type in a decision-making group. If your group is more homogeneous th than this, and it is sometimes, 
then you have your work cut, cut out as a meeting leader because you need to pose more critical questions. You need to play the devil's advocate and you need to be aware of this. So actually it's easier just to invite diversity into the room. I want to define diversity for you research wise, but before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about information processing and the definition of cognitive bias. They're defined as systematic errors of judgment that skew our perception. This is a definition made by Nobel Prize receiver uh, Daniel Kahneman. He was the first psychologist to get the Nobel Prize in economics, and he did so for his research within decision making and showing how us human beings, we're not as rational always in our decision making as we think we are. You can look at it like this. We have our meta level of thinking up here in the top of the triangle. We are very proud of this. This is where we get our great ideas. This is where we're very reflective. This is where we set us apart from other animals. And sometimes we think that we make all our decisions up here, but we don't. As you see, it's a small triangle. This symbolizes that it's an uneconomical way of thinking. We don't have that many resources up here. Uh, so we are lucky that it stands on a foundation of our own experiences, what we remember, what we live through ourselves. And that again has an even broader foundation of cultural norms, old habits, things we didn't necessarily live through ourselves, but we believe when people tell us that this is how the world works. But notice this out on the right hand side, we go from the conscious level of thinking and down to the most subconscious level of thinking. And it's down here that bias thrive. Up here we have system two thinking, it's slow, it's critical. Down here we have system one, it's fast, it's efficient. But the byproduct down here, that's what we call bias. And that's what happens when we are totally locked in an efficient everyday life and we don't challenge our thoughts. So ever, ever, each and every one of us, even though I research within this area for, so, area for so many years, I still have bias. If you have a brain, you are biased. You can think of it as having a set of glasses on that are a little bit tainted or colored by your culture, the culture you're brought up in, the culture of your workplace and how you normally work. And uh, we need to invite people in with another point of view to challenge our own bias and then we'll challenge theirs. This is actually the easiest way to minimize bias in everyday life and thus open for possibilities of innovation. And I'll get back to that point. But what is diversity? Because if we want to invite it into our decision making to get more creative, innovative and make better decisions, then we need to know what it is. And in research, we often divide it into these three categories. We have demographic diversity. You can see it here in the right hand corner. It often has to do with age and gender and so on. Uh, it can also have to do with se sexual orientation that you cannot see on the outside side, but often you can see it. And for that reason, many organizations, they start here because you can see when you get more diverse, you can measure it, you can count it. And it's not a bad strategy, but if you don't work on the second, a dimension of diversity, then it will not help you at all. The second dimension of diversity is the value-based one. It has to do with political view, political, political views, religious views. It also has to do with personality types. So if you do personality types in your organization that builds on young, it could be colors, it could be uh, uh, letters. If you do work with personality types, that would also be the value-based um, dimension of diversity. Here you don't want to recruit for it, but what you want to do is to train your inclusion muscle. Every one of you in an organization that works on diversity and re recruit for diversity should train your inclusion muscle or else your uh, organization might end up having a revolving door of hirings because there's no room to actually embrace the inclusion, the, the diversity in the organization and you cannot 
you, you don't get the potential out of the diversity. You need to train the inclusion muscle to get the potential out of diversity. One way to do this is, and you'll actually get this as an exercise to go, go home and do this. What I want you to do is to scan your environment, your network for a person that has a totally different political view than yourself. Then I want you, during this next week, I want you to say hi to that person, say, can we drink a tea, coffee, water, something together? And what you need to do in this meeting is to be curious about why they have the political views they have. You cannot convince them of anything else. You should not necessarily uh, take on their views either. But what you need to do is to practice listening. Listening and understanding why do they have this standpoint. Then you train your inclusion muscle. And there are a lot of other ways to do this, but please go home and do that one. The third one is informational diversity. This has to do with differences in education and work background. I won't, don't, I won't get deep into that one because this has been evident in organizations for many years that this is a good thing to work on. But actually, I want us in organizations to work on all of these dimensions and combine them and not just see diversity as a mean in itself. It should be a mean to achieve strategic goals, a mean to, to means to, to get to innovation. And it can be a means to achieve these strategic goals because we have so much research showing that when we include different perspectives, we get better decision making. And we get everyday leadership development because if you lead a group like this at your right hand side and you don't just make them look different, but actually give them voice so they can voice their different perspectives, then you train your own inclusive mindsets because it's more difficult to lead a group of people that are more diverse. You need to open up for different perspectives. And then you need to feel you have the leadership, uh, uh, the, uh, the meeting leadership skills to close down the meeting again and get a common direction. That is leadership training. And for that, you need to get into the balance of the right amount of friction in a room when you open up for the voices, but you close down again and get to a common decision. When you add this right amount of friction, then you actually enhance psychological safety because people, they get a voice and you saw the seed for innovation because the different ideas can merge and we can inspire each other. So this is actually what this book of non-biased conscious leadership is about. It's about tools to give you the right amount of friction, frictions that give you different uh, perspectives on a problem and leads to innovation and better decision making. So there are many tools in this book, and of course, I can just share a few of you, a few of the tools with you. So how to reduce bias and get to innovation. I've already touched about, about upon the importance of building psychological safety. We also need to train the inclusion muscle. You got one exercise for that. The problem with this, uh, these exercises, the reflection exercises, is that they use our meter level of thinking. And I have more tools within this toolbox uh, that you can use, but actually I rather want to share some other tools with you too. So we don't take up too much space from this meter level of thinking because we want to use this for our everyday work life. We want to use this capacity when, when we work and uh, on the assignment we are on right now. And because the bias, they, they thrive the most at the cultural norms and old habit levels, that's where we want to sit in with some other tools. And here we can use behavioral design. We can actually make nudges that makes it easier to do the right things down on this level. And there are many areas we can nudge. We can nudge our surroundings and make it more inclusive and more spurring for innovation. We can nudge our communication. Uh, as leaders, there's a lot of uh, ways we can communicate uh, and just every one of us, the way we write emails, there are a lot of things we can do here to be more inclusive. 
Social proof is actually a, a means to uh, reduce bias because it's a way to turn the first bias I shared with you, the hurt mentality around, because when we know that we imitate each other, we can turn it around and be role model and imitate each other in a good way. We can also work with our procedures and processes. We can create procedures for bias, uh, to minimize bias in recruitment. We can also uh, notch our decision making in meeting situations. And that is actually what I want to share with you some notches on today. So we want, we could, uh, for example, we could notch for allyship in a meeting situation. Let me explain. The thing is, what we can see in research is in meeting situation, ideas that bounce back and forth and we share ideas and we borrow ideas from each other. And it's not necessarily to be mean that we kind of steal ideas from each other. We, we just get inspired. And when we are inspired and we kind of stole an idea, it's been set over here at one side of the table and then another person says and then suddenly everyone hears it. This is usually a person that has higher status in the room and this person hasn't necessarily noticed that they, they borrowed the idea from someone else. They are so into what they're saying right now so they don't notice. But when you out there, when you notice this, then you can actually help the conversation along. You can be an ally in a very polite way. You can do a validating inclusion notch by referring to the owner of the idea. You can just say, well, that's really interesting what you're saying there. Isn't this kind of along the line of lines of what Alice or Ali or Alan said before, depending on who said the idea? Because then you invite the per in person into the conversation again, and they don't need to sit there and say, well, I actually said that first. That's very uncomfortable for all of us. So inclusive leadership and allyship, this small notches like this that you can use in meeting situations. So what we want to, to get to is we want to get innovation to thrive and it thrives in the inclusive organization. You find in the inclusion organization in the balance between degrees of uniqueness and degrees of belongingness. And it is a balance. It's kind of like a unicorn, this uh, inclusive organization. It's something you need to work at all the time because all of us as a psychological human beings, we need to feel unique. We need to get respected for our unique ideas and what we bring to the table. But we also need to feel safe and we need to feel we belong. And there's a balance between these two. And we cannot, cannot reach that balance without training our inclusion muscle. And we need to train it every day. I've given you two uh, areas for training this muscle. You can train it by actions. You can train it by inclusion notches that you can draw into everyday life. And I'll share one more with you. So when you go into a meeting situation and uh, you want to not all uh, have the same idea as the person with the most status in the room. Give yourself uh, the time and space and your group the time and space to reflect. Read out loud the agenda for the day. Choose one point that you need different views on. Uh, and then you have everyone write uh, their ideas on a piece of paper. It's good to get it out on the hand. Just write there for two minutes silence. So everyone land in the room, everyone get their own idea about this particular topic that minimize hurt bias because we actually get to be specific on what we think about this topic before the first one or the, most, uh, the person with most status speaks. That's a good idea to do this. Another uh, thing you can do here is make everyone circle what they thought was the most important thing they brought to the table. When they circle that, you write, they write it into uh, a, a document. In this document, uh, it could be an online document, Google Docs or something. The same person needs to read all these ideas out loud. Now you have an idea bank. The reason you need to do this is to minimize stereotype bias. The thing is, the same good idea, it doesn't sound the way, same way depending on who speaks their idea. 
So when the idea comes out of a mouth from a person you really like, it sounds way better than when the same idea comes out of a mouth from a person you don't really respect. For that reason, it's good in the start of the meeting to remove the ideas from the owner. The last thing I just want to refer to again is the reflection. That is the psychological safety. You need to do reflection exercises too. All the reflection exercises that had to have to do with mentalization, they built on this drawing here. You can see two people, they are fighting. They are actually both, uh, uh, they, they see the, uh, something that's true. They are actually both right. This happens every day in our organization with the complex problems we have. So what I invite you to do is to, to if you see a nine, go around the problem, see it from different sides, stand in the shoes of the person who sees a six, look at the worldview from this person. You might never really agree with this point of view, but I promise you, you will be better at making decisions from the common good and you'll be better at moving this person because sometimes it is a nine. All the new people see a six, but I promise you it will be much easier to get to the common ground and make the good decisions if you have seen the world from that person's shoes. So this is what I brought from you today. Um, yeah, and I think I'll actually end my keynotes here and I hope you have some questions for later and this inspires you to look more into this. I'll stop sharing my slides now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, Christina's book is available. Obviously, uh, I've read it. it. It's a very thorough um, entry into the, the field of bias awareness. Um, I'll try the exercise that you suggested. I'll try it with my partner. Finding a person with a different political view won't be that hard to me. I'm not <laughs> sure about the listening part, though. Let's see how that goes. All right, okay. So let me in reintroduce our wonderful panel. Hi uh, Elisabeth Hilmose from AI Branch Manager for AIG in Norway, Nora Sultan, Legal Associate for Kennedy's, Leah Lundstel, um, Pay Equity. Sorry, um, let me just, yes. Pay Equity Leader for Europe and UK HR Transformation for Mercer. Welcome, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Christina just guided us through um, the psychological mechanisms behind bias and we tend to, uh, and why we tend to follow and act on them and how diversity could lead to innovation. So tapping into our theme of innovation, would you help me answer if there's a way of looking at innovation connected more to equity, inclusion and access, meaning that uh, what Christina just described for us that um, diversity and bias awareness can unlock uh, more innovative processes in our workplaces, but is there more than a solid business case for for DNI? Why not simply implement uh, EDIA, DNI, DEIA strategies and initiatives because it's the right thing to do? And why? Maybe I pick one of you to start off. Um, Elizabeth, why don't you start off our conversation? Well, I, I actually think it was quite well presented by Christina, and I do think there is a quite solid business case out there. It's been documented again and again that diversity of thought does raise innovation. Um, but then I think actually the, the real interesting question is maybe the underlying what is diversity of thought and how do you actually create a room where you can actually access the various ways of thinking. So I think, and, and Christina also touched up on that, diversity of thought is, you know, creating an environment where you have diverse experiences, life experiences, where people are brought up with different backgrounds that can be religious, 
that can be cultural, that can be gender, that can be social. I mean, diversity is so many things, but what we the, the lives we live mark us, right? Um, and, and that is what we want to bring into the work environment, because that's what we actually want to access as business leaders to get, you know, away from the group think that Christina described so well, and into an in innovative environment where uh, ideas can actually sp sp spread, spire, you know, <laughs> uh, grow. That's my perspective. So, so yes, there is a business case. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Nora. Yeah, thanks, Fahad. Um, you know, I, I, I have to agree. I think there is definitely a strong business case um, for implementing EBIA. But, you know, I think in a traditional business setting, innovation is often talked about in the context of, you know, technological advances and how we can improve efficiency or, uh, you know, product breakthroughs. But actually, I think that the scope is a lot wider than that. Um, and at its core, EBIA should be about creating a culture that actually re represents a wider range of perspectives and skills. Um, so yes, I agree that it's, it's, it's a matter of social justice and ethical obligations as well. But um, in my opinion, innovation is actually a byproduct of overcoming challenges. So, you know, um, in some of the more historically uh, marginalized groups, I think they have very unique viewpoints that are often derived from their challenges. So by championing EDIA, um, I think that organizations can probably open a fresh, you know, a door to th fresh perspectives um, that can inspire, you know, transformative ideas. So yeah, again, there's definitely economic incentive, but equally there's also a human one. And, um, you know, that's just the creation of a more equitable society. Thank you for adding that, Nora. Leah? Yes, thank you so much. And and uh, you know, touching or building on both what what Nora and and Elizabeth said, and and obviously Christina's uh, keynote, I, I think the key question for companies is to, from an innovation perspective is to ask themselves what are we what are we not seeing today, uh, what are we missing out on, which talents are we not tapping into, uh, what are which customers are we not listening to or paying attention to today. So, so as as uh, as Elizabeth says, there's you know there's tons of research into this, but I think these are the fundamental questions that that we're also asking ourselves, and I think we'll come back to that a bit later. What we're doing at MERS and how we see that here, but really think about what are you not seeing today? Which talents are you not tapping into? Which customers are you not uh, paying attention to today? Got it. Thank you so. Thank you for adding that, Leah. Um, now, going back to diversity and inclusion and looking at, at DEIA, EDIA as an acronym that could be described as a process, um, I hope you don't mind if I ask if um, what happens if we look at diversity on its own, meaning can diversity really stand by itself? Um, why do we need to create a sense of belonging or a culture where you could have a sense of belonging as belonging as Christina described for us. Um, why do we also need to have a perspective of equity as well? And how and when can access be hard to add to the perspectives of EDIA? And I think if I ask one of you to answer first, that would be the way to go about it. Leah, why don't you? Sure, lead us? sure. Happy to. So, so I think, I mean, I, I think your uh, the answer is also a little bit in your question in itself. So, so in my view, inclusion is the foundation. Uh, so yes, you can have a diverse team where no one thrives. So again, sort of bringing it a little bit uh, down down to earth, I would say. Um, I would say, you know, feeling that you belong at a workplace is fundamental and, and, uh, but it also changes. So some days are different, you know, the human mind is different every single day. So, so I would say a litmus test is, can I go to work 
every day and show up no matter how I feel in the morning, no matter what my life situation is, keeping that in mind as well. So I think that's the, the test of, of the work environment and the culture that we, we want to create. Um, Thank you, Leah. Elizabeth, could you tap in? Yeah, and I, <laughs> I was going to say when I started working with diversity, they actually very much stood on its own. It was it was nearly assumed that if we just get a diverse group, uh, we will get all you know uh, the benefits of it. Feel people feeling belonging, uh, feeling people feeling they could speak up. Uh, and I think one of the things I realized, at least on the journey, is that structures matter. And we have to create some structures that actually support uh, our wish for uh, for the diverse, diverse voice to be heard, be heard right? Um, so I think, and I think that's actually, to a large extent, a corporate or leadership responsibility as well, to create a structure where people feel invited in. Um, I then want to challenge the employees and say it's then also an employee responsibility to grab that that opportunity and let your voice be heard, right? Uh, so, so there's a nice uh, play uh, between actually leading a company and being employee that should uh, that can make this move forward. Um, yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Nora, um, if we tap into uh, the part about inclusion that could be connected to a sense of belonging or a culture of belonging. Um, could you try to describe for us uh, if you have any perspectives on, first of all, why this is important, but next, what can help you uh, as an employee, I mean, compared to Elizabeth and Leah, uh, they're, they're in leadership and management level where you're at an employee level. Uh, so maybe you could tap into what sense of belonging could feel like when it happens and why it's important. Yeah, thanks, Fahad. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I think true diversity, uh, sorry, diversity without true inclusion is probably very superficial at best. Um, and I like often to give the analogy that it's like inviting somebody to a party, but actually not making them feel welcome once they're actually there. Um, so a diverse workforce, I think, is just the first step. Uh, but it also must be complemented by, you know, a culture of inclusion and most importantly, accessibility to truly make an impact. Um, so as, as to equity and, and access, which you, you kind of um, asked about, um, I think these are both kind of pillars that ensure that everybody has an equal chance at success. So at more of an employee level, you know, for instance, you mentioned this earlier, Fahad, that, you know, accessibility is not just physical access to a building, for example, but it also means um, providing for opportunities for career advancement, um, you know, learning and, and, and uh, development uh, and, you know, these types of opportunities, irrespective of for example, somebody's socioeconomic status or ethnicity, et cetera. So um, just to answer your question about what inclusion feels like, I think to me, uh, inclusion feels like empowerment because not only are you in the room, but you're also, but also your voice is valued and your contributions are genuinely appreciated. And I know that that's how it is for me at Kennedy. So. I think that's a very good way to describe it. Um, I can definitely connect to that. Thank you for adding that, Nora. Okay, so going a bit further, um, this is a question to Elizabeth and Leah. Um, so you are both uh, at a managerial leadership level. Um, and if we di uh, describe the, 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 the the discussion, the conversation, and the field of DNI, EDIA, um, gaining traction as a leadership skill. We've seen it moving from not just being a, a field that is connected to HR, uh, going more into valued as something that we want to see in strategy and in uh, at. at and as a skill at a leadership level. Could you describe or could you share your opinions on, on why we are seeing the shift and what could be at hand here? 
who would you like Elizabeth, to start? <laughs> Elizabeth, why don't you start off? Okay, I think I think I actually I think first of all I think most leaders, myself included, want to do the right thing, right? So I think that's sort of just to put it, you know, take it all down. Uh, I think it's about doing what's right as well. You know, you want to have a, a work environment where everybody feels they can contribute, where everybody feels empowered, as Nora talks about, right? So, so. Um, and, and I think, as Nora also very nicely put, then you have nice spin-offs of that, right? You actually get more uh, productive employees that perform better. You get more innovation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I do think, sort of from a starting point, that's where we are. And then I think we also have to realize that there's a constant fight for talent and, and uh, that we have to have in our backs of our heads. And I think having a workplace uh, where everybody feels they are empowered is actually quite attractive to any generation, to any uh, gender, to any cultural background. You know, I think that's it's nearly universal that the feeling of being able to contribute, um, being able to make a difference, is is one of the things I actually think that we humans um, are motivated most by, especially when we have our first uh, needs um, fulfilled. So, so I think there's something there. And then uh, thirdly, I think we have um, a leadership responsibility to make our companies future ready or, you know, keep thinking of beyond today uh, and, uh, um, and incorporating uh, diversity, equity, inclusion and uh, access is one way to assure that we, you know, are forward thinking in our way of operating is including the new uh, perspectives into our leadership that we challenge ourselves as leaders as well. I mean, uh, I think we are, as humans, has a tendency to listen to all the praise and all the your rights and all the. Uh, um, this is one of our major biases, as Christina also alluded to, and I think you know uh, that is actually a leadership challenge to 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 um, cultivate your own doubt. Thank you, Elizabeth. Is there anything you could ask, uh, add and uh, apply to the context of AIG? Well, I think um, I did talk a little bit about earlier about structure and en having enabling structures. Uh, I think one of the beauties actually to in working for a big American company is that they are much more advanced in creating these structures than we normally are in a Scandinavian context. Mm -hmm. Uh, we nearly have a tendency to think we are already there and uh, difficult to discuss diversity, equity and inclusion when you're already at the goal, right? Um, I think that is changing though, but, uh, but uh, so let that be a cliffhanger. Um, but one beautiful thing is these structures and one of the things I want to highlight is maybe our um, uh, employee resource groups. We actually have a formal structure around driving um, uh, the voice of the employees via these employee resource groups. Um, and they are formed by the employees. It takes three <laughs> to be a group. So, and they are, they have uh, uh, different uh, labels that you can actually pick. So for the Nordics, we have uh, a resource group called Women and Allies. I want to underline the allies. It's not merely for women. It is actually also for all the allies, um, uh, the ones that feel connected and the ones that want to, uh, you know, make a difference. Uh, but this is the, there's a budget following it. There's a voice following it. There's a, a responsibility for leadership to actually meet up with this group and, and hear their insights. And there's activity that creates a sense of belonging associated with it. So, I mean, I have several examples of how American companies actually can help us as a lever into, uh, to be, you know, training our diversity muscle. Thank but, you, Elizabeth. Uh, but this is just one of them. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. All right, Leah. Okay, so um, because of our conversation that is flowing and reg in regards of the time that we have left, this is the part where I ha have some personal questions aimed at each of you as panelists. So um, I'll be jumping a bit, um, uh, as, um, jumping a bit, um, and asking you ahead of time, Leah, 
um, one of the questions we prepared ahead of time. Um, so, Leah, you're, uh, you're in the position of pay equity leader. Perhaps it could be interesting if you could describe your work and the, the, yeah, the work that you do, uh, first of all, and what it involves. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think so. Let's maybe let's talk a little bit about what how how I support clients. So my role as pay equity leader means I'm I'm supporting a lot of clients with their pay equity uh, and inclusion uh, processes and results as well. So uh, so so essentially, one of one of the areas we have in focus now is the new EU directive on pay transparency and equal pay. Uh, and and what we expect to see from that is uh, essentially pretty much in alignment with what the EU expects, which is more fairness when it comes to pay, more transparency, more equality. So let's lower the the gender pay gap, not just the the raw pay gap, but uh, which is now 13% across EU. But let's let's minimize it as much as we can. So um, so how I, I spent my time today is really discussing with organizations, how do they prepare for it? And I would say we are, we are at the full spectrum of the change curve. So we have a lot of companies of various sizes who are in complete avoidance and saying, how can this go away? Uh, this will be too difficult. We're not prepared. Uh, you know, we, we're not ready at all. And then we have a, luckily a lot of companies who are already in sort of the acceptance stage where they say, okay, we actually want to be on the on the forefront of this. We want to be ahead of the curve. How can we do that? And I think this stems from already having different generations represented at work. Among Gen Z, there's a much higher expectation that there's transparency and fairness, that we can discuss our pay, our salaries, but also that companies are transparent from the beginning when we start applying for jobs, what is the pay range? What can I expect? We know from, again, tons of academic research and probably anecdotes as well, that women have a tendency to ask for a lower starting pay than men. So if we don't put in structures, to Elizabeth's point, if we don't put in structures saying, actually, you can't ask for a previous salary, or actually, you must share the expected pay range. If we start embedding those structures, we actually create more fairness uh, from from the beginning, so that's how I spent my time uh, along the way. But that's one so, thing that I just wanted to mention, and I know Christina, you have a point as well. But that's just one thing I wanted to mention. The reason why Mercer and Marsh is is in this, and this is a little bit more from an insight perspective, is because we 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 can we can see and we measure, we can see we have a higher success rate with our customers if we show up and work with them uh, with a diverse team. We don't win customers by showing up for white ladies or for white men uh, from one country. That doesn't bring us any clients. We can actually see that we are much more successful if we're both men, women, uh, others, if we're from different backgrounds, nationalities, ages, and so on and so on. So for us, that's the business case, I mean, to be completely honest. Thank you so much, Leah, for describing the need for um, pay transparency. It's basically the this is where we can thoroughly measure equality and where we can see uh, in the numbers where fa where fairness and unfairness still exists. So the EU directive will be very very important in creating um, more pay equity. All right, okay, so skipping a bit uh, in the planned questions, I would love to ask you, Nora, about um, something that uh, I often meet from, from clients with developing DNI strategies, um, especially within the field of communication. And it's the fear of doing something disingenuous, where pinkwashing and tokenism uh, can be at hand. Uh, now, in preparation for our, our webinar today, you and I discussed how it, uh, important it is that workplace culture is not disconnected to the people we are outside of the workplace and that our employees create a space for every part of our identity. Um, so, uh, but with you and, and the questions that we talked about, 
before today, um, how would you describe how, how we balance a workplace culture that creates space for intersectionality while not tokenizing minority employees? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I think first and foremost, it's really crucial to clarify that while I may be a visible minority, my, my lived experiences are not representative of a whole. Um, and actually, they're very uniquely my own. Um, so, you know, I actually have been very fortunate to come from a very privileged background where my upbringing was, you know, both unique and, you know, kind of protected compared to um, other minorities. And, you know, while my lived experience was was not and hasn't really been one of struggle, I have seen firsthand um, some of the struggles that my parents faced who were immigrants uh, to Canada. And, you know, that experience has kind of given me a lens through which, you know, I can recognize injustice and, um, and, and something that, that that's something that's really permeates my kind of existence in both my personal life and probably also covered um, or colored rather my my choice of career as a lawyer um, you know and the concepts of injustice and equality and empathy um, are not just ab abstract ideas but are actually real and tangible principles that have practical implications um, in the world so just to answer your question as for tokenism you know I think it's also important for me to mention that Kennedy's didn't ask me to be here today um, or to speak on this panel, but that I, you know, chose to be here because this is an initiative that's really important and, and close to my heart. Um, but, you know, I think the issue that you raise is a really important one that, you know, it's a challenge, I think, to many organizations and even those with the best intentions um, can often struggle with. And it's an essential to differentiate between inclusion but also with tokenism and you know inclusion means giving individuals you know the space to bring themselves as a whole to work um, you know without judgment and, or disadvantage while tokenism often refers to someone's identity you know just as a check mark to a diversity quota um, you know i think one of the most effective ways to avoid tokenism is actually to shift the focus from an individual representation to a systemic change um, and, you know, an intersectional approach would really be crucial here. And it's not just one that looks at diversity in isolation, but also one that would consider all the multifaceted identities and experiences of all the employees. And, and that way, we're not just, I guess, avoiding bias, but we're actually actively creating a space that recognizes and celebrates um, the richness that comes from a very, you know, diverse workforce. So I think that the key here is education, number one, um, but also awareness at the leadership level. And, and both Elizabeth and Leah have both touched on this. Um, and, and at Kennedy's, we've also really worked hard to transform these, this kind of awareness into initiatives um, to, to, in an attempt to kind of move the dial on um, EDIA strategies. So for example, um, our affinity networks at Kennedy's are represented by partners um, through a senior sponsorship program. So it's not just, you know, an HR box ticking, box ticking exercise, um, but it's actually one that's deeply embedded in the firm's strategic, you know, approach and focus. And um, I know that we've also recently launched a reciprocal mentoring scheme, which, you know, unlike traditional mentoring, sees the employee as, you know, the mentor and the, the more senior colleague as the mentee. Um, and then this kind of just offers a two-way exchange of perspectives, um, you know, cultural versus professional. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's not just about awareness. It's also about translating the awareness into policies and practices that are actually woven into the very fabric um, of the organization's culture. Thank, thank you for adding that, Nora. Uh, and it's uh, great that, uh, that, that you described how important DNI is for you as a, as a value and that you weren't forced to be here as the token minority from Kennedy's. Um, all right, okay, so with the time at hand, uh, we're almost at our final question, but before we dive into the final question, Elizabeth, I would love to uh, for you to just add very, very quickly and very shortly um, with your experience as a branch manager, how uh, how you apply international guidelines for DNI in a regional context. Where does it work? Uh, and where do you face difficulties? And why does this make sense? You've touched on it just a little bit already, but if you could give us just a short 
um, sentence about it. Okay, I think that's a difficult to, question to keep short, but I do think, you know, there's, I would call it a dance between, um, as we talked about the American um, system being much more developed around uh, structures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they had this dialogue and have had to have this dialogue for much longer. I think, um, I think uh, in a local context, I think what we are rich with is actually our ability to talk. We have low hierarchy um, and easy accessibility. So I think combining those two is actually um, quite forceful. So, uh, um, so, so it's in meetings, you know, letting everybody have the chance to speak out, ask the people who didn't speak out to actually come with their point of view. Um, it's simple tricks like that. But then we have a whole uh, ambition behind it. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm so sorry to be, uh, for the unfair question that requires more complexity. We're at the closing question. And I would love for each of you, each of you as panelists, to leave us with an advice or something that we can take away if we were to do this panel again in one year and meet again. What change would you have liked to have seen within this year? Um, and Leah, why don't you lead us? Yes, so so essentially I would I would encourage everyone to think uh, to get started and whether it's it's uh, getting started from a legal perspective, which is your license to operate. Uh, uh, I would actually more encourage you to explore what are the opportunities? What are the opportunities for innovation if you have a stronger focus on, on diversity, equity and inclusion for your organization? So that would be my encouragement to everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Leah. Nora? Yeah, I think my comment would be, you know, directed to those in a leadership role. I, I just want to say that your commitment is crucial. Um, just continue to educate yourselves and your team. Make uh, EDIA a central part of your strategy and, and just ensure that this is reflected in every aspect of the business. Um, you know, and that in, in doing so, you're going to transform your good intentions into actionable uh, steps and you know, only through these collective efforts can we really achieve a more equitable and inclusive inclusive work environment. Thank you, Nora. Elizabeth. Yeah, I think this whole conversation actually reminded me of a, a, a really key skill, and that is to be curious, to be curious about how you can be an ally, be curious about who's not whose voices didn't you hear today and why. Be curious about how can you make a difference. Be curious about, you know, also the things that maybe a little bit, I was going to say politically incorrect, but how is it to live with a handicap? How is it to live with a different cultural background? Be curious about this. I think Christina so nicely talked about uh, transforming the six to a nine, uh, you know, by putting yourself in the other shoe. And I think um, that's my, that is my personal takeaway, to remember to be curious. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, Christina, you started us off with uh, a keynote speech, really validating this whole conversation. Um, any perspectives and advice you would love to leave, a, leave us with? 